We're glad to have for the first time on our lectureship program, Brother Max Miller. Brother Miller is the director of the Bellevue School of Preaching, and the pulpit minister for the Bellevue Congregation in Pensacola, Florida. I've heard a great deal about Brother Miller. It was not my privilege to have met him before the Southwest Lectures in Austin last April. But from what I understand and from what I hear from uh, brethren who do know him and do know him well, that he is a staunch supporter of truth and the proclamation of the gospel of Christ. Brother Miller is a native Tennessean. He served in the Navy in the Asiatic Pacific Theater in 1943 to 46 and uh, has been for a number of years a teacher, deacon, as well as a preacher in the Lord's Church. He's done located work with churches in Raleigh, North Carolina, and Covington, and Jackson, Murfreesboro, Woodboro, and Trenton, Tennessee, and is now, as we mentioned, the evangelist for the Bellevue Church in Pensacola. He's uh, in good demand, great demand, for various lectureships, and of course conducts meetings across the country. Other than uh, the pulpit and the classroom, administration of the School of Preaching, Brother Miller also has spent a number of years in daily radio and television work. He's been involved in prison ministry and as well as the director of West Tennessee Children's Home, which is a child care institution. He has a great interest in uh, religious journalism, having been the editor for a number of uh, religious journals, but, and now currently edits the Defender publication of the Bellevue Church in Pensacola, which is distributed widely throughout the United States as well as overseas. We're grateful to have Brother Miller, and he has consented to address us on a very difficult as well as a timely and necessary and vital subject entitled The Deity of Christ. Brother Miller. Thank you, Brother Whitten, and indeed it is my pleasure to be in with the Brown Trail Church of Christ and their preacher training school in this series of lectures. I'm deeply honored to be here and to be a part of this lectureship and to learn more firsthand of the great work of this particular congregation. Through the years, I have heard of the Brown Trail Church and, then of course, its training school for preachers been interested in your work as well as that kind of work throughout the kingdom. And it's a pleasure to be able to come here and to see a great number of people that are assembling for the lectureship through the day and to know more of your school and, of course, of your director. And we would uh, include this work in our prayers for the preaching of the gospel and the training of men to go out into all of the world. So I'm very thankful, Brother Whitten, for the opportunity to be here, the invitation, and my prayer has been that my coming might be of some benefit to someone as we attempt to speak on the great subject of the deity of Christ. I think the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 3.16 may have summed up the deity of Christ as well in one passage of Scripture as it could possibly be summed as he was guided by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached on into the world, to the Gentiles, believed on into the world, received up into glory. That that passage of Scripture is almost unfathomable to the human mind. It includes so many truths whose depths that we cannot plumb to the very bottom that when we begin with our finite minds to think of and to study of the infinite being, we soon realize our 
limitations in the human mind. Job's friend, Zophar, asked the question in Job 11 and verse 7. He says, Can one find out God by searching? Can one find out the Almighty to perfection? And of course, the answer would be in the negative. Man in all of his search cannot know all there is about deity. He cannot know him unto perfection that is in the completeness of his being. In Psalms 90 and verse 2, Moses, allegedly the author of that psalm, said, Before the mountains were brought forth, and ever thou had made the world, the earth, and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. So then we can see that in these passages of Scripture that we're talking about something that is beyond man's full ability to know all about. But yet we are aware, too, that God has revealed himself unto mankind. In the Garden of Eden, that he came in the cool of the day, he conversed with Adam. In what form and such that he came, I know not exactly. I know that later on that he came to Abraham in Genesis 18 and 1. As Abraham sat in his tent there in the plains of Mamre, he made his appearance known to him. In Exodus 3 and 14, God appeared unto Moses in the burning bush. Also in the book of Exodus, you remember how it was that God manifested himself unto Israel as they traveled those 40 years in the desert. In the cloud by the day, in the pillar of fire by night. I've read and reread the first chapter of the book of Ezekiel and tried to draw that picture in my mind of that scene of this wonderful creature with eyes that turned in every direction and wheels that went in every direction, the flame of fire. And, of course, it would defy the abilities of the greatest artist of the world. But here was the manifestations of the presence of God. He manifested himself in many ways in Old Testament times. But the most complete manifestation of the revelation of God is in the person of the Christ. That Christ came into this world that he might would declare God unto man. And so then we study the scripture's revelation concerning the Christ. We would find that for our studies we would divide it into three major divisions. And the first would be that which we'd speak of as the pre-incarnate Christ. That is his being before we come to know him as Jesus the Christ, the babe at Bethlehem, and the one who died on Calvary's cross. And then the second area of our study would be the incarnate Christ, Christ manifest in the flesh, or Christ in the flesh. And then, of course, the third area would be the glorified state of Christ when he ascended back into the glory of the heavens and assumed his rightful place there. We first think about the pre-incarnate Christ, <coughs> and this is somewhat of a mystery. We may not understand all that we would like to about it. It's somewhat of like his very birth. Matthew 1 and 18, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. It took an angel to explain it to Joseph sufficiently so that he could accept it. In verse 20, it told him that in Mary's womb was that which conceived of the Holy Spirit, or that is, of the Holy Spirit of God that this was that which was in fulfillment of prophecy, that the virgin, that she would be with child, bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is 
God with us. But nevertheless, we understand that the Christ was that one who was in existence even before his birth, before we learn of him in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, we find that he antedates all beginnings of things, whatever they were, spirits, angels, material things, that he antedated all of those things. In Micah chapter 5 and verse 1, Blessed art thou, Bethlehem, Mepertah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, who shall be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been of old from everlasting. The marginal notes there says, from the days of eternity. In Colossians 1 and 17, it says that he was before all things. In John 5 and verse 58, he stated, Before Abraham was, I am. And in that expression, we sometimes speak of the eternal present tense. There never was, Ben, there never was a time but what the Christ could say that I am. In John 17 and verse 5, he prayed that he would have restored unto him the glory which he had before the world was. When we think about Christ, we must think about Christ as eternal. That antedates all beginnings. That he is an uncreated being. When we begin to study the doctrines of men, we'll find that it is generally denied by many sects and cults of the everlasting nature of Jesus Christ. One of these cults has devised their own Bible translation, the New World Translation of Holy Scriptures, the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they've taken great liberty and they perverted the truth in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, it speaks of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And then begin to insert, insert in brackets the word other and makes this passage have this meaning. For by him were all other things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all other things were created by him and for him. And he is before all other things, and by him all other things consist. They've told us that this word on other is in brackets to give a fuller meaning of the passage. But yet when the word other is inserted in that passage, it perverts that passage. And of all that we might say that is evil about translations of the Bible, there's not a more evil, more wicked translation or perversion of the scripture than that passage in the New World Translation of so-called Holy Scriptures. Because it denies him the very nature of deity as being everlasting, and their teaching is that he was first created himself, he is lesser than God. Their translation in John 1.1 1, 1 says that he is a God, therefore that he's lesser than the Almighty, and that after he was created by the Almighty God, then he becomes the agent of creation. But in 1 John chapter 3, it says that he is the creator of all things. And without him was not anything made that was made. And of course this passage of scripture in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, correctly translated, avows the fact that he is the, translator, that he is the creator of all things, visible and invisible things, things in heaven and things on the earth, that all things are made by him. Therefore, he is an uncreated being, and he himself is the creator of all things. 
He created all things that are in heaven and in earth, that he is the beginning of the creation of God, Revelations 3 and 14. Another passage that the witnesses would say that this is evidence, this is scriptural proof, that he was the beginning of creation, that is, he was that which was created and the first thing that was. But yet when we turn and we find that the word beginning is the Greek arche, that it is cause. He is the cause of all things being created. And that he himself is uncreated. When we think about the pre-incarnate state of Christ, we realize that there's a great number of scriptures that evidence his beings from the earliest of times. In Genesis 1 and verse 26, when there was the voice of heaven that said, Let us make man. In Genesis chapter 11, Let us go down and confound their language at Babel. It hears the personalities of deity, and it included, of course, the Christ. We cited a few moments ago in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. His goings forth is a bowl from everlasting, from the days of eternity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, when Paul is rehearsing the affairs of the wilderness wanderings of God's people and how that God cared for them in the wilderness and gave them manna from heaven and water from the rock, he speaks of the rock of the Old Testament, God. And that rock of the New Testament is the Christ. And he says that that rock that followed them was Christ. In 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, he speaks of his former glory that he had in heaven above and how that he surrendered that glory and came to the earth that we might would be enriched by his sacrifice at Calvary. Moses was an Old Testament character, and he believed in the God of the Old Testament. But in Hebrews 11 and verse 26, concerning Moses, that he was willing to suffer the reproach of Christ, that he counted the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. And so then we can see that the New Testament writers and the inspired writers of the Bible attest to the fact that there was the Christ of the Old Testament. We do not see him clearly as we read the pages of the Old Testament. And yet as we read the pages of the New Testament and the light that is furnished there flashes back upon those Old Testament scenes and even unto the days of eternity and reveal unto us the very everlasting nature of that glorious being that we speak of as the Christ of God. But yet for our great benefit and to the glory of God, he made his advent into the world of men. Stated very briefly by himself in John chapter 6 and verse 38, I came down from heaven. I came down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. In John 3 and 13, he had made that announcement that he had come down from heaven, that he came down from the lofty peaks of glory and wonder and splendor, that he came down unto this earth to perform a mission of redemption and salvation for you and for me. He came to the earth in the flesh. We hear him spoken of more often as son of man than we do son of God. And we're grateful for the fact that he is son of man. There are a great number of Old Testament prophecies concerning the coming of this wonderful one. In Genesis 3 and 15, there's the seed of the woman that would do war with Satan himself. That he would be wounded in that warfare, but yet he would rend a mortal blow unto the power of Satan and overcome his power of death, hell, and the grave. 
In Isaiah 7 and verse 14, there's the prophecy concerning the virgin birth. And the one that was born of that virgin would be called Emmanuel. In Isaiah 9 and verse 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor of the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. All of these was looking unto the coming of that August one. We again would refer to Micah 5 and 2 that his coming forth would be out of Judah. That he would be the one who would be the ruler in Israel. The everlasting one coming into that period that we speak of is time that he would live among men. Joseph was told that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, Matthew 1 and verse 20. And then, of course, the fulfillment of all of these prophecies. Thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. The New Testament reveals the fact that that Holy One, that Eternal One, came in the flesh. John begins his wonderful writings of the gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14 he says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the one that has declared God, verse 18. But an amazing passage that has caused me a great bit of thought is to be found in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 5. And we're familiar with the Hebrew epistle where it speaks so many times of the sacrificial offerings. In verse 1 of chapter 10, it speaks of the fact that these offerings were a shadow of the things which were to come. They were not the real thing. And the reason they were not the real thing was because it was impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. That they served a purpose in God's scheme of redemption for a time. But yet they could not take away, they could not atone for the sins of man. And so there would be a time in God's scheme that he would cut them off and receive them no more. And therefore we're introduced to verse 5 when he said, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not. The sacrifice upon those altars of Israel, the pouring out of the blood of the Lamb upon those altars and the burning of that carcass, that body, no longer would be acceptable unto God. Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. So then we can see the very work of God there at Bethlehem. That the Christ came into the world into the flesh. That he needed a body to relate to man. He needed a body to lay upon the altar of sacrifice, Calvary's cross. Life is in the blood, the Levitical order tells us. And he needed that blood, that life blood, to give for the sins of the world. For we're washed, made free, in the blood of the Lamb. Our Lord came into the flesh, and in the flesh, Paul says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God manifest in the flesh. He writes of this in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. <clears throat> After having stated in verse 11 that the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, and that it teaches us certain things, and as it teaches us that we're to be looking, we're to be looking for the return of Christ. But in that verse he says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. In that passage of scriptures, we've studied it properly, speaking about the God Savior, the one who became man, manifested to man in the flesh, 
The one came into the world to save man. And therefore, we're to look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearance of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But now then, for him to come into the earth in the human form, my friends did not rob him of the very being that he is, had been, was, and always will be. For him to come into this earth did not mean that he lost his divine nature, I read a very interesting book. I'd heard of the man, read of him somewhat through the years. A few years ago, I read the book, the autobiography or the biography of Peter the Great. And I suppose that it was the greatest blessing that Russia had ever received in human form. And he began to be aware that his people, that his country was a very backward nation. Great, large, with immense resources, but yet they were paupers in the world. He steps down off of his regal throne, and he begins to travel across the world. He left the borders of his kingdom. We find him in the Netherlands, in the lowlands. We find him in France, and sometimes he's working as a baker. He went on over into England. The English were the great shipbuilders, and they ruled the world of the seas. And he learned what it was to build ships and to see how they used in the world. He was always Peter the Great, the king of all the Russias. But he had surrendered the independence of his regal being and powers in order that he might would travel out of his kingdom into the other world that he might would perform a mission for his people. And this is exactly what the Christ has done, that he came out of the land of glory and heaven and eternalness, and he stepped down into the earth to perform a mission, that he surrendered the independence of his deity. But yet Paul said of that lowly one, trotting the dusty streets of Nazareth, Jerusalem. He says that in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power, Colossians 2, 9 and 10. So whoever he was, he has always been. But yet we would need to hasten to say that although he was always deity, he came into this earth and he surrendered that divine role of life in order to become son of man. Sometimes we read in books of theology, and this is spoken of as the kenosis, the self-divesture, the humiliation of Christ, and Paul writes of it, particularly in Philippians chapter 2, in verse 5, he introduces the person Christ. In verse 6, he says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, being found in fashion as a man, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Here he says in verse 6 that he was in the form of God. He did not think that it was robbery. He didn't think that it was taking away anything from deity. But yet he willingly became the servant of man. And that he was obedient unto death, even the despised death of the cross. And it says in the likeness of men, that simply means that he was man. Like we are alike. He was one that was afflicted with poverty. At Matthew 8 and verse 20, it says, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. In 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, You know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, how that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. 
as a man that he was tempted at all points, like as we are, yet without sin. Yes, he was subject to sin. He was one that could have sinned, but he did not sin. He did not sin because he simply resisted the powers and the temptations of Satan. He was one that suffered, 1 Peter 3 and verse 18. He was one who once suffered for sin. And he was one who died like we expect to die, except his death was more shameful, the circumstances of it, than likely our deaths will be even the death on the cross. And so then you see that our Lord indeed came down from heaven. He came in the flesh. He's always been who he is, but yet he surrendered that for a season of time in order that he might would become man, came to man to serve man and to deliver man from the throes of his sin. He was one who indeed was not inferior. Subordination does not mean inferiority. He played a subordinate role. And we see people all across our world playing subordinate roles. On the police force, you have the patrolman on the beat. You have the sergeant. You have the lieutenant. You have the chief of detectives. You have the ones that are over those. And we have the descending order of subordination. But yet you would not say that the patrolman on the beat or the one in the car is inferior as a man or as a being unto others. Naval and military forces from the commander-in-chief down to the rawest recruit seaman is subordination, but yet not inferiority. Whenever our Lord began to play that subordinate role as man for that period of time, he was not inferior to deity. He had cause to come to this world, the cause to establish his kingdom that was prophesied of old, the everlasting kingdom. My church, as he speaks of it in Matthew 16, verse 19, the kingdom of heaven, and that kingdom, kingdom came as a reality on the day of Pentecost and shall continue forever and forever. He had cause to come to this world to seek and to save that which is lost. Luke 19 and 10. And in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20, I believe it is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. God was in Christ. And he had to come down where man was that he might withdraw man away from the world and ultimately elevate him unto the glory of heaven. Everything that he came to do in this world, he accomplished it. Premillennial teachings that he came to establish a kingdom and failed is false to the core. He said in John 9 and 4, I must work while it is day, Night cometh when no man can work. Just before he ascended unto the glory of his Father, the high priestly prayer of John 17, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work that thou hast given me. Then on the cross itself he says it's finished. That was not the last to the Christ. But that was the last of his redeeming work. For within a short while there would be that spear that was thrust into his side, and the blood mingled with water that would flow forth, which would wash us from our sins. His mission of the earth had been fulfilled. God manifest in the flesh. For the very next two or three minutes, we want to speak of the glorification of Christ. The last earthly scenes show Satan victorious. That long time he had sought to bring the Christ to his knees. 
and all of the scheming through evil men, he had been able to accomplish that. And they took the nails and drove them through his hands and through his feet, and they put him upon the horrible cross at Golgotha. But yet his apparent victory was short-lived. And shortly after his crucifixion, his time in the tomb that the women came to make further preparation of his burial. And there that they saw the angels, and the angel says, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, he is risen. That he had been raised, and that he had been carried into the very heavens itself. And we find in Daniel chapter 3, or chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14, Daniel had visions at night, and he says, And I saw in the night visions. Behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds, came unto the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near unto him. And there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom. And therefore he ascended back into the glory of heaven and retained the glory, received the glory that he once had. That there was the dominion, the authority and power that was now his. And here was the everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and a kingdom which shall not be destroyed. And therefore that he sits and he reigns and he rules now in his kingdom in the heavens. And not only does he continue as king of kings and lord of lords, 1 Timothy 6.15, but there that he is our advocate. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, 1 John 2 and verse 2. In Hebrews 7 and verse 25, that he is our intercessor. In 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5, he says that he is our mediator between us and God. He not only continues that work in glory, but he's one who stands ready to judge the nations when that time is right. In John 5, 28 and 29, Marvel not, for the hour cometh when all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. My friends, he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, which was, which is, which is to come, the Almighty. John said in Patmos Isle, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me and said unto me, Fear not, fear not. He says, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, am alive forevermore, and have the keys of hell and death. Let us worship him and adore him as the eternal Savior of our soul. <clears throat> and we dare not water down the truth or compromise the truth so as to try to make a defense. We need to get back to the book to try to understand exactly what's taught about this thing called faith so that we do not make the mistakes of Robert Schuller at all. Else we shift on the lifeless sea of uncertainty in so doing. Study, study, study. As you've never studied before, these are difficult times, times in which uncertain sounds do not need to be ringing forth from our pulpits or from our classrooms. Study this matter of faith, and may God bless you as you commit your life to the task. Thank you.